This is a part of black history that no one talks about, but in this video, we will uncover the abuse of black male slaves by white women. The history of slavery is a dark testament to humanity's boundless capacity for cruelty and oppression. In America, this brutal institution was deeply rooted from the early colonial days through the antebellum period. Enslaved Africans and their descendants were subjected to the harshest forms of labor, physical punishment, and soul-crushing degradation. The term antebellum, drawn from Latin roots, where anti means before and bellum means war, marks a grim chapter in American history. The years leading up to the Civil War, specifically from the late 18th century, following the War of 1812, to the conflict's outbreak in 1861. This era, steeped in contradictions and burgeoning tensions, encapsulates the social, economic, and political forces that ultimately tore the nation asunder. The term antebellum era is commonly used to describe this period because it captures the distinct social, economic, and political characteristics of the time, which ultimately led to the conflict and division that resulted in the Civil War. It was a time of great transformation and growth in the United States. Industrialization swept through the North, while the South expanded westward, fueled by the relentless debates over slavery. In the antebellum South, the institution of slavery was not just a cornerstone, it was the very bedrock of society. The antebellum South was characterized by the use of slavery and the culture it fostered during the possession of this era. Southern intellectuals and leaders gradually shifted from portraying slavery as an embarrassing and temporary system to a defense of slavery as a positive good. The abolitionist movement, which had just come into existence then, was harshly criticized by these leaders for being in opposition to slavery. The demand for more slave labor and the U.S. ban on importing more slaves from Africa drove up the prices for slaves, making it profitable for smaller farms in older settled areas such as Virginia to sell their slaves further south and west. Most farmers in the south had small to medium-sized farms with few slaves, but the large plantation owner's wealth, often reflected in the number of slaves they owned, afforded them considerable prestige and political power. During the antebellum era, the nation grappled with issues such as states' rights, the expansion of slavery into new territories, and tensions between the North and the South. These factors contributed to the eventual outbreak of the Civil War, which had a profound and lasting impact on the country. In the midst of this maelstrom, the dehumanization of enslaved people is well documented. There is ample evidence of sexual exploitation, from the brutal assaults that some might characterize as romantic liaisons between white slave masters and black women. Yet, there is just a more shadowed corner of this grim history. The abuse suffered by black male slaves at the hands of elite white women, the so-called planter class. These planter class white women were not mere bystanders. They were the wives and daughters of the wealthy plantation owners, deeply enmeshed in the fabric of a society built on human bondage. They were women who wielded significant power within their homes and on their lands, power that extended to the command and punishment of enslaved individuals. These wealthy plantation owners were referred to as a planter class, while their wives who had privileged positions within the social hierarchy of the time were the planter class white women. However, using an intersectional socio-historical analysis, this video delves into the often overlooked history of the exploitation and mistreatment faced by black male slaves, exploring the factors that they may have contributed to the incidents of sexual encounters between the planter class white women and slave men, the power dynamics embedded in them, and their implications in terms of sexual consent. This segment further demonstrates how these upper-class white women who engage in these relationships use sex as an instrument of power, simultaneously perpetuating both white supremacy and patriarchy. White women as slave owners. Slavery was not only a system defined by racial subjugation, but also one that reinforced the gender hierarchies. While the planter-class white women in the antebellum South were bound by societal expectations of femininity, they still held significant power within the context of slavery. These women played active roles in maintaining and perpetuating the institution of servitude. The authority they wielded extended to the management and treatment of enslaved individuals, especially black male slaves. White women had the power to issue commands and enforce discipline within their homes and on plantations. It is of great relevance to note that in the American South before the Civil War, white women couldn't vote, they couldn't hold office, and when they married, they became property of their husbands. But there was one thing they could do. They could buy, sell, and own enslaved people. In the book, They Were Her Property by Stephanie Jones Rogers, the historian makes the case that white women were far from being passive bystanders in the business of slavery. On the contrary, as previous historians have argued, they were rather active participants, shoring up their own economic power through ownership of the enslaved. They owned, bought, and sold slaves just as men did. In the past, historians had often based their conclusions about white women's role in slavery on the writings of a small subset of white Southern women 
that Jones Rogers, an associate professor of history at the University of California, Berkeley, drew on a different source from the slaves themselves, taken from formerly enslaved people conducted during the Great Depression. As part of the Federal Writers Project, these interviews showed that white women were trained in slave ownership, discipline, and mastery, sometimes from birth. Some were even given enslaved people as gifts when they were as young as nine months old. White slaveholding parents trained their daughters on how to be slave owners. They would give them lessons in slave discipline and slave management. Some even allowed their daughters to dole out physical punishments on the enslaved, according to Jones Rogers. Her research indicates slaveholding parents and slaveholding family members gave enslaved people as gifts for Christmas and Sweet Sixteens. This legacy contributed to the creation of racism and human degradation as traditional as a holiday. The abuses these women inflicted were not confined to the realm of labor or discipline. They extended into the darkest corners of sexual exploitation. One of the most distressing aspects of the abuse endured by black male slaves at the hands of elite white women was sexual exploitation. Although the dominant narrative often portrays white women as passive or innocent, there were instances where they actively engaged in non-consensual sexual relationships, exploiting their power and control. These actions perpetuated a cycle of violence and degradation, further dehumanizing the already enslaved. Here's one example as told by Harriet Jacobs in her book, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. In her autobiography, Miss Jacobs, a former slave, talks about how planter's daughters would take advantage of male slaves. These women knew that the women slaves were subject to their father's authority in all things. They in turn recognized that their own authority could be exercised over the enslaved, especially the men. Ms. Jacobs noted in her book, I myself have seen the master of such a household whose head was bowed in shame, for it was known in the neighborhood that his daughter had selected one of the meanest slaves on his plantation to be the father of his first grandchild. She continues, she did not make her advances to her equals, nor even to her father's more intelligent servants. She selected the most brutalized, whom her authority could be exercised with far less fear of exposure. Such an act was not uncommon, nor can it be classified as consensual. Throughout history, such power dynamics have been ridiculed and even prosecuted in modern times. Through examples like that, we see that plantation women, like their male counterparts, were able to sexually control and abuse their slaves. Another method of sexual coercion by these women was through blackmail. By way of threats that would allude to the enslaved being the perpetuators of forced relations, these women of the elites would gain control of the male slaves. Manipulation over these slaves kept the power of exploitation in the hands of the planter's women. Possible Causes The reasons behind these women's actions vary. Boredom, sexual frustration, or a subconscious attempt to assert power in a patriarchal society where they themselves had limited agency. They were, after all, the property of their husbands, stripped of significant freedom and often isolated on plantations while their husbands pursued business or pleasure elsewhere. Planter-class women were considered the property of their husbands and lacked considerable sexual agency relative to men, along with no political power and very little economic power. It is possible the exploitation of slaves by women of that time proved to be a source of enjoyment that created a feeling of power. By acts of violence through discipline and domination, these women were able to exert control at at least one area within a society in which they were relatively powerless. Married women and daughters within these social classes had restricted freedom and mobility. They were generally not allowed to travel without an older male chaperone. They were also themselves victims of spousal abuse, which was, at that time, considered a reasonable method of solving marital disputes. Surely, these factors contributed to bouts of frustration and resentment combined with having to watch their husbands have extramarital affairs, along with mixed children popping up on their plantations. This offspring was both humiliating and heartbreaking. The abuse was not just physical, but psychological and emotional. Historian Catherine Clinton described plantation mistresses as prisoners in disguise, trapped in a society that demanded they remain dutiful and cheerful, even as they endured the heartbreak of seeing their husbands mixed race children among the enslaved. During the antebellum era, Many Southern women were married off at ages as young as 15 years old. These women were often left alone as their husbands fulfilled military duty, travel for work or pleasure. Physical Abuse and Madame LaLaurie As the mid-1800s approached, slavery consolidated to mostly Southern states. Historians believe with that consolidation became more brutality. The physical violence perpetuated by white women against black male slaves was brutal and relentless. It ranged from whipping and beating to more grotesque forms of punishment, leaving indelible scars on both body and soul. The notorious case of Madame Marie Delphine LaLaurie, who inflicted unspeakable horrors upon her slaves, stands as a stark reminder of the depths of human cruelty. Her torture chamber, discovered after a fire in her New Orleans mansion, revealed the extent of her sadism, 
Slay is mutilated, tortured, and left to die in unimaginable agony. April 10, 1834, after a mansion in the French Quarter of New Orleans, Louisiana, a fire broke out. However, as rescue crews arrived, they noticed something odd. Madame LaLaurie was trying to save her jewels and furs, but without the aid of her slaves. When asked where her servants were, she feigned ignorance and seemed agitated. The fire brigade heard faint noises and moans coming from her attic. But as they bust down the attic door, what they saw was nothing but pure horror, hell, and torture. The brigade had found her torture chamber. Her attic was filled with enslaved men who were subjugated to diabolical acts of dehumanization. She had chained one slave to the stove, forcing him to cook and starve simultaneously. Legend has it, he is the one who started the fire. Born into privilege, the Lori's life gave no early hints of the monstrous cruelty she would later inflict. Her actions, however, revealed a darkness that stunned even her contemporaries. The discovery of her torture chamber shot the city and tarnished her once respected name. Though she fled justice and lived out her days in relative obscurity, exploring the abuse of black male slaves by white women exposes a haunting dimension of history often overlooked or deliberately silenced. By confronting this painful reality, we challenge the sanitized narratives of the past and deepen our understanding of the complex power dynamics at play. Acknowledging these historical injustices is a crucial step toward building a more inclusive and equitable future. What do you think about this hidden chapter of history? Share your thoughts in the comments and stay tuned for more extensive content, including a deeper dive on the horrors of the antebellum era.